The Navajo are a Native American people of southwestern USA. Their textiles are quite famous. An example of their textiles is their chief's blankets. These blankets are divided into various phases. There's the first phase, chief's blanket. We're talking about simple banded blankets. The second phase, chief's blankets have nine band elements. So a row here, a row in the center of rectangular shaped elements. Lastly, there's the third phase chief's blanket. Has these same diamonds, but they're, they're more triangular shaped. Their varying qualities are used to differentiate these three types of chief's blanket. That is really how we distinguish the various phases. Kit Carson is famous for being an American frontiersman, army officer, and fur trapper. But who would have guessed he had anything to do with this blanket? The blanket has Navajo origins. It came into Kit Carson's hands when the U.S. government sent him to round up all the Navajos. This occurred in 1876. Originally, this blanket would have belonged to a Navajo chief. So here you have a Navajo chief's blanket with a general that took the Navo Navajos to Bosque Redondo. Sadly, there are no official documents or photographs linking the blanket to the Navajo tribe. As such, this Native American blanket is now worth between the Navajo Chief's blanket is worth 350 to 500,000. What we have before us is a magnificent portrait, masterfully crafted by a legendary artist and illustrator. This portrait features a pilot related to the guest, personally selected by the artist for a Pan Am advertisement illustration. Mr. Rockwell was asked how he wanted to put this ad together. He says he wanted to use a captain. That's how he was chosen by Rockwell himself. Norman Rockwell, a household name in the art world, is the artist who brought this to life. Norman Rockwell was a renowned American artist and illustrator, best known for his realistic and heartwarming depictions of everyday American life. Norman Rockwell is one of the best known, if not the best known, American illustrators. He was a chronicler of the times of people's lives. Rockwell's work frequently appeared on the covers of popular magazines, such as the Saturday Evening Post, where he showcased his ability to capture the essence of American culture, values, and traditions. When he was very young, he started illustrating Christmas cards. And he did his first Saturday Evening Post cover when he was 22 years old. Oh my goodness. The painting, done on canvas, shows no signs of significant deterioration. But I think over the years, it's yellowed. So you see all of this yellowness on the yeah, surface. Yes. I was afraid that I couldn't find the right person to clean it and, and repair it. It's a stunning piece of art that has been meticulously preserved over the years. Given Norman Rockwell's immense popularity and the record-breaking sales of his works at auction, this painting's provenance would likely command a high valuation of. I would say that if this were to be sold in a gallery at the present time, it would sell in the range of 75,000. Oh, goodness. Oh, I'm so happy. This is a watch inherited by the guest from his father. It appears from the engraving that's in there, it seems like it was a gift to the family because it says in Spanish to the family of Ricardo, Richard. So it, it probably came from Cuba then. It was made circa 1880 by the Assmann Watch Company in Germany. The watch is known as a half-hunter cased watch and is crafted from gold. Upon opening the front cover, we can see its silver dial, adorned with intricate gilt decorations. Also on the dial, we can see the name of its maker, Julius Assmann. Assmann was a renowned German watch manufacturer from the 19th century. Yes, Assmann himself was an exporter primarily to South America. On the back of the watch, there is an inscription in Spanish, along with an engraved advertising banner. Watches made by Assmann are highly collectible, and this gold half-hunter watch would easily be worth between six and eight thousand dollars, which is far more than most watches of this period. And it's a, it's a lovely thing to have survived. Yes. What we have on the show today is a sapphire bracelet. The guest acquired the piece many years ago at an auction. It features a beautiful pastel blue sapphire set in an 18 karat gold bracelet. This piece of jewelry dates back to around 1950 and bears Italian hallmarks. During this period, designs often showcased bold yet refined designs, with a focus on symmetry and intricate settings. At the time this piece was made, only a handful of individuals could afford it. Sapphire bracelets like the one on display are highly sought after by collectors. In an auction setting, this sapphire bracelet, given its rich features, would likely sell for. I would say about six to $8,000 auction estimate for this bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<laughs> I did not expect any place near that much, but uh, wow. The item came from their mother, a German countess whose family fled Russia to France. A ruby and diamond bracelet from the Belle Epoque. It was supposed to have belonged to Marie Antoinette. That's the story I got from my mother. It features rubies set amid intricate diamond formations, balancing color and sparkle. The top features very tiny full-cut diamonds set in platinum. Rubies, vibrant red gems, have long symbolized wealth, power, and love. In the late 19th century, they were prized in European jewelry, often from Burma, known for its rubies. Pigeon blood rubies were prized for their rich hue, favored by aristocrats. The diamond arrangement showcases the intricate designs of the Belle Epoque, emphasizing delicate beauty. This ruby and diamond bracelet adorned a woman of high social standing at formal events. Its exquisite design and rich history led the appraiser to value the item. It's like this in today's market, could easily sell for somewhere between thirty and $35,000. This piece? This piece, at auction. From holy water to heirloom, the story of a 17th century silver basin. This piece, acquired by the grandparents in 1925, was originally used as a vegetable dish. It was crafted by a notable silversmith active in the late 17th century. The item is likely designed for use in a church, potentially as a basin for holy water during christenings, which adds to its historical significance. Upon examining the underside, the mark E. Bogardus can be found. This signature is particularly noteworthy, as Bogardus typically used only his initials E. B., making this piece more unique. The design is quite plain, reflecting the typical functional style of that era, especially for ecclesiastical items, which were meant to be simple and unembellished. Especially if they're for either use in churches, okay. it was kind of quite, quite plain, quite simple. Um, pieces by him don't come to auction very often. Pieces by Bogardus are rare at auction due to their historical context and limited availability. The expert estimates the value to be between four and six thousand dollars. At auction, I would say is a conservative estimate. I'd put four to six thousand dollars on it now. The guest brought in some incredible pieces of jewelry from the royal family from the end of Queen Victoria's reign. Here is a pair of Russian gold cufflinks with alternating rubies and diamonds known as nugget effect, or samorodok in Russian language. The nugget is an old Russian technique favored by Fabergé, the famous jewelry firm founded in 1942 by Gustav Fabergé. However, these cufflinks were not made by Fabergé, but by a man named Ivanov who worked in St. Petersburg. These cufflinks were given to a man named Nicolas II. He was a Frenchman and chef who served people like Rothschild and Sutrum in Devon. But he refused to work for Edward VII when the latter requested his services. I really don't know. I imagine because they were given to my great-grandfather, they must have been cufflinks. The second pieces of jewellery were given to the guest's great-great-grandfather, and they were originally cufflinks, but have been remodified as brooches. These are typical of Fabergé's work, with the enameling technique known as guillotine enamel, which combines the art of engraving using an engine-turning machine combined with vitreous enamel. But it is not confirmed, as the marks have been lost due to the remodification. Moreover, the last piece is certainly Fabergé, due to the use of the guillotine enamel. Yellow enamel, gold colors, laurel wreaths tied with a diamond bow which serves as an emblem of peace. It also features the Romanov crown set with diamonds and circled with pearls, and on the back is the maker's initials of August Holming, who was a specialist in enameling. For value, the Russian cufflinks with the provenance on them would be worth around seven to eight thousand pounds. The souvenirs of Nicolas II would be worth eight to ten thousand pounds, while the Fabergé jewelry would fetch around. Well, it is ten thousand pounds, and it's oh, more than ten thousand pounds. Is it? Yep. It's fifteen thousand pounds. <laughs> My dear chap. Oh, <laughs> it's wonderful. That's amazing. Here is a piece of jewelry that is believed to have belonged to Lady Jane Grey, known as the Nine Days Queen. Lady Jane Grey, also known as Lady Jane Dudley after her marriage, was an English noblewoman who claimed the throne of England and Ireland from the 10th to the 19th of July, 1553. Jane was the great-granddaughter of Henry VII and was in line to the throne after her cousins, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. She got married to Lord Guilford Dudley in May 1553, a younger son of Edward VI's chief minister, John Dudley. However, in June 1553, Edward VI wrote his will nominating her and other male heirs as successors to the crown because his half-sister Mary was Catholic, but Jane was a Protestant and would support the Reformed Church of England, the foundation which Edward laid. 
Following his death, Jane was proclaimed queen on the 10th of July 1553 and waited for coronation in the Tower of London. However, the Privy Council of England suddenly changed sides and proclaimed Mary as queen, deposing Jane on the 19th of July 1553. Eventually, she was executed along with her husband on the 12th of February 1554 as she was seen as a threat to the throne. The interesting thing about this jewellery is that the silver is dated to the 17th to the 19th century, where you would find little pieces of natural history shells, horns and hooves of antelopes and beetles. They were mounted and turned into jewels called magical jewels. These talismanic jewels were worn to ward off the evil eye, and the broken cowrie shell is a female fertility symbol for good luck. Moreover, at the back is inscribed Lady Jane Grey. However, the jewellery is not only reference to the English martyr, and is just a beautiful reminder of history. I'd say its value is absolutely next to nothing, which is absolutely unimportant to me, because I think it's loaded with interest. And let's hope it brings some good luck to both of us. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? These baskets were passed down through the owner's family from their great aunt in Arizona. The expert identified them as likely from the Gila River Reservation, possibly. Pima go. Okay. Part Pima, part Papago. It's very old. One basket is an early Papago basket, woven between 1890 to 1900 using Pima materials. The other basket, from around 1920 to 1930, was crafted for tourists with non-traditional designs. Both baskets are made from willow and devil's claw, with the older one featuring a rare butterfly wing design. Unlike typical Pima baskets, neither of these has the traditional whip stitch around the edge. The baskets have aged gracefully, showing patina and wear that add to their character. At auction, the older basket is valued at. This basket, I think we're talking $1,000 to $1,100. Okay. Yeah. And this basket, a retail value would possibly be around $750. Okay. The owner brought in a painting they had assumed was just a tourist souvenir. They believed it had been painted repeatedly, making it less valuable. The painting had been a part of the owner's life. It was part of my bedroom, and all of a sudden I've got to look on it as a, as a valuable... Although it's now seen as a valuable piece of art, the owner still finds joy in simply looking at it. The painting remains in its original frame with the original nails, which the appraiser praised. The owner isn't sure about cleaning it, as doing it right is important. This discovery made their day, as they learned far more about the piece than they expected. To their surprise, the painting was appraised with an auction estimate of... I'd put it at two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. Oh, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Oh, it was such a nice picture to just sort of have around. This stunning necklace was gifted to the owner's mother by her father in the early 1970s. It's not a piece one can wear casually, requiring a ball gown, which limited its use. At one point, the owner traded part of the necklace for her. I'd swapped it, part of it for a puppy. A puppy? And I thought my mother and father would really approve of a necklace I probably wasn't going to wear to a darling Jack Russell by the name of Mac. Eventually, the owner borrowed the necklace back, despite joking concerns the puppy might be reclaimed. The piece is believed to be by a British jeweler from 1975, possibly a contemporary of. A jeweler that was named Andrew Grima. He was a British jeweler making jewelry in London, and basically he liked to use all of these amazing crystals and geodes. It features an amethyst geode split in half to resemble butterfly wings, adorned with tiny diamonds. The necklace is 18 karat gold and considered a unique piece of jewelry sculpture. At auction, its estimated value is to be... I would say auction estimate would be between $3,000 and $5,000. That's very nice to hear. It also about makes sense, because I didn't think my father probably went and spent 100000 This collection of World Series baseball programs was passed down from the owner's great-uncle. The collection spans from 1905 to 1954, showcasing a rich history of baseball. A 1905 World Series program, handed out at the now-gone Polo Grounds, stands out as the second World Series program ever. The program is neatly scored, documenting the Game 5 showdown between Hall of Famers. The scoring tells us here that Christy Mathewson challenged Chief Bender. Both Hall of Fame pitchers. Matthewson led the New York Giants to victory, winning the series 4-1 against the Philadelphia Athletics. The condition of the program is impressive, considering it's over 100 years old. A similar program recently sold at auction for an astounding... One recently just went for $12,000. Wow! 
This makes the 1905 World Series program incredibly rare and valuable. This fascinating collection of license plates dates back to the owner's grandfather, beginning in 1950. Every license plate carries the number 1583, a family tradition that continues today. Massachusetts was the first state to issue state license plates, starting in 1903. The collection includes rare porcelain over enamel plates from 1915 and... Uh -huh. This is a tin embossed license plate. Due to World War II metal shortages, Massachusetts only minted new plates for registrations in 1943 and 1944. The collection extends through 1967, after which Massachusetts switched to sticker registrations. Auction estimates suggest the entire collection could fetch two to three thousand dollar range. Wow. The owner's granddaughter is set to inherit the license plate tradition next. This extraordinary painting was created by Richard Lindner in Paris in 1945. Richard Lindner was an American artist who was associated with the New York pop art scene in the 1950s and 1960s. This German-born artist migrated to Paris from Munich in the 1930s when Hitler was declared chancellor. Richard Lindner, the artist behind this masterpiece, was also the guest's uncle. In 1972, he was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, New York. He was even friends with Andy Warhol, the great American visual artist. Look at this yellow figure in painting with the breastplates. Quite the pop art thing. Considering how this painting was somewhat the starting point of pop art culture, the appraiser estimated it to be. But I'm just going to put it there. I think it's worth at least 40 to 60,000 pounds. Really? <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. In 2005, collectibles expert Simeon Lippmann encountered a surprising find at a roadshow. A man with a sling brought a Tupperware container to the event. When opened, the container revealed two iconic figures, Rudolph and Santa Claus from the 1964 special. Lippmann initially assumed they were replicas, but the man's story changed his mind. My aunt worked at Rankin Best Productions for about 10 or 15 years in the 70s and early 80s, and she acquired all of them, and they were the production puppets from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Puppets were used in the actual production of the movie Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Puppets included Rudolph, Santa, Yukon Cornelius, Herbie, and others. Unfortunately, many of the puppets were damaged over time. Only Santa and Rudolph survived in the attic, but these also needed restoration. Littman estimated the pair's auction value at... If I were to estimate it at an auction, I wouldn't estimate it less than eight to 10000 for the pair. Mm -hmm. Santa's whiskers and Rudolph's nose had been replaced. After restoration, the puppets looked like new. Present value of these iconic puppets is... If it sold well over $100,000, maybe more. Um, I believe they are that iconic, they're that important. A 19th century Chinese vessel uncovers its ancient burial roots. The guest mentioned their mother. This is a 19th century Chinese cloisonne enamel vessel. It was likely to discourage playing with it as a child. The appraiser identified it as a 19th century Chinese cloisonne enamel vessel. It mimics a burial piece from the 12th to 10th century BC. In ancient times, such vessels were used to bury food with the deceased for the afterlife. The design is still quite popular today. The appraiser estimated its auction value. But I think it was so that I wouldn't play with it as a child. The guest was pleased with the appraisal. A Civil War rifle that has been in a family since 1912 is brought for appraisal. Apparently, the gun has lived through different times because it was made in New Haven, Connecticut, as seen on the lot plate. And in the back behind the hammer, we have the United States. So, it was made by Whitney in New Haven, Connecticut, the same company owned by Eli Whitney who is credited for inventing the cotton gin. An interesting thing about this gun is where it went, which is inscribed on the back as South Carolina indicating that Whitney had contracts with the state of South Carolina to supply them weapons. The gun predates the Civil War, about 1810, and it shows the state it went to, and a design stamped on it says 28th. This gun is what collectors call attic mint, because unlike other guns, it has been kept in an attic of some sorts. Moreover, the gun originally came out as a flintlock, but has been converted to a percussion system, which substantially affects its value. It is a smooth bore 69 caliber musket with a drum style conversion that fits the South Carolina style, and the hand fringed hammer is often referred to as a Confederate conversion. Without the South Carolina mark, this gun would be worth $1,500, but with the mark, even in its present condition, a retail value on it would be. It appeals to a whole different level of collectors. Even in this condition, the retail value on this gun would be between six and $8,000. Wow, I'm, I'm amazed, totally amazed. 
This item belonged to the guest's great-great-grandfather back in the early 1800s and was passed down until it got to her. It is called a ship's chronometer, made by the firm of Parkinson and Frodsham, who were famous London makers in the 19th century. Marine chronometers were founded in 1801 and have an important naval history of knowing what time it was. In order to determine what the longitude was for celestial navigation, you needed to know what the exact time was. The guest had many receipts that showed how to calibrate the chronometer, and there were always two or three chronometers on a ship. Furthermore, the number in front of it, 1846, is not the date, but the number of the chronometer itself, and the key for winding it is the same number to show it's complete. Therefore, this instrument made around 1835 would have a reasonable insurance value around. If you're insuring this in today's market, I would insure this for around $5,000. Wow, wow, that's a really good value, but the most important value is the personal. A former director of the UCLA Drug Abuse Training Center in the 1960s brought a poster which she received from Tom Benton, who was one of the principals of Normal at the time. Normal is the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws, and this poster was designed by Thomas W. Benton in 1970. Benton fought in the Korean War in 1963 and afterwards relocated to Aspen, Colorado, where he lived and worked with Hunter S. Thompson for decades. He was an established artist who made incredible arts and posters for national politicians, such as George McGovern, Gray Hart, and Willie Brown. Another wonderful part of this poster is the sentiment by the great philosopher Spinoza. He who seeks to regulate everything by law is more likely to arouse vices than to reform them. This poster is signed by Thomas W. Benton and inscribed to the guest. Although Benton's work generally sells for around $700 to $1,000, due to the exciting story portrayed by this poster, an auction estimate would be between. I would think that at auction, uh, an estimate for this piece would be between $2,000 and $3,000. Wow, that's, that's nice. Very nice. These carvings belong to the guest's mother and were made in Nigeria when the family moved to Africa during her father's exchange program with the University of Nigeria. Although many people think of Africa in terms of masks and tribal sculptures made for tribal use, when colonialism started in Africa, it created a market for carvers to do other things. Specifically, in the 1930s, an artist named Akira Dolu, a carver in Yoruba land, Nigeria, became the father of what is called the thorn carvings. These items are thorn carving style and are meticulously done. For instance, one carving is a depiction of an individual tapping palm wine from a palm tree, while another shows the village life of Africa. However, these designs were made for the decorative market, where folk art is getting hot. Individually, these items may not be worth much, but as a collection, with its rich heritage, it could be worth around. With the wonderful heritage that you have, the background on it, this group is worth two to three thousand dollars. You're kidding. No? Wow. No. The guest brought in a poster of Montana Creek and Paradise Valley that helped to advertise the gateway of Yellowstone Park. It was done for the Northern Pacific Railroad in the early 1930s. Although the specific date is not known, it was probably made in 1930 or 1933. And the name of the artist is Gustav Krollman. He was a very renowned artist in the railroad, but little is known about him biographically. Gustav created at least five posters for the Northern Pacific Railroad, three of which were Montana-specific. This poster, the second, was North Coast Limited, and the last was Mission Range. He painted these posters, rendering the landscapes in different colors to make them fascinating, and featured one of the railroad's locomotives on each of them. Northern Pacific posters were made to sell tickets on the road. They were printed in St. Paul, Minnesota, and distributed across the railroad. However, these posters have been going higher in price recently, so if this poster was in an auction, it would be estimated at. If this piece were in an auction, I would suggest an estimated value between $2,000 and $3,000. Really? Unframed? As it Unframed, is? unlined. You'll notice really? this poster hasn't been mounted. That's excellent. This poster belonged to the guest's father. It was one of the posters he acquired at an auction in Iowa for about $30. It is a poster showcasing the Moan Brewing Company in Iowa, and the combustion engines depicts it as early. The main brewing company went out of business during probation, but this poster was made before the construction started as a forecast of what the brewery would look like, due to the profit they were making at the time. Also, the poster shows the bottles they were going to use, which are consistent with the picture of the brewery in 1915. Today, $30 will buy about six packs of beer, so this American advertising poster for beer, known as Brewery Arna, was a good investment after all. Therefore, with the details and condition, a reasonable auction estimate would be around. This would be estimated $1,500 to $2,000. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. You're I appreciate welcome. that. I'm glad you brought it in. Some heirlooms are more than just objects. They tell the stories of extraordinary lives. In this case, the guest has brought a collection of memorabilia from his great-grandfather, Graham Conacher Young, a Royal Flying Corps pilot during World War I. The collection includes medals, a watch worn during flights, and even logbooks that meticulously document his great-grandfather's wartime service. Among the items is a picture of a specialized aircraft-mounted gun, complete with a large drum for cartridges. The gun was designed to fire over the propeller, ensuring it wouldn't damage the plane. A critical innovation of the time. The guest's great-grandfather received three medals, each representing his service in different campaigns. The first, a General Service Medal, was awarded for his late World War I service in Mesopotamia, now Iraq, still a place of global significance today. The second medal, the Victory Medal, commemorates the Allied victory, symbolized by a winged figure blowing a trumpet. And the third, the War Medal, was awarded for his participation in the Great War, a common pairing with the Victory Medal. These medals are significant particularly because they were awarded to a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps, the precursor to the Royal Air Force. This makes the medals even more special, as the Corps was established in 1912, marking the beginnings of modern aerial warfare. While the guest has no intention of selling, the estimated market value of the collection is probably about a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds, because it's just yeah, it's just a fantastic collection. Yeah. Drew and his team kick off their trip by driving 160 miles to To kickstart their trip, the boys have driven 160 miles to Coniston Water. Coniston Water, a picturesque area with a deep mining history. They visit one of the oldest copper mines in the region, where Drew has been invited to see a collection Phil Johnston has been curating for over 50 years. Phil, a lifelong architectural salvager, has transformed the mine into a heritage center. Inside, Drew finds a pair of ceramic glazed dairy bowls. One bowl has a crack, but the other, a late 19th century slipware bowl, is in good condition, from Wales. Drew offers for the intact bowl. For that one. I'll take 50 for that one, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's marvellous. Next, Drew discovers a pair of wooden patterns used in making iron and alloy turbine wheels. These patterns, which date from the 20th century, are ideal for decorative use. For both, Drew negotiates a price of... £70. £70, pounds sold, sir. Thank you very much. The standout item of the visit is a large oak-stained shop counter with 16 graduated drawers. Despite some damage, Drew recognises its value and agrees to pay. A thousand pound on the floor. It can be a thousand pound in the back of your van if you want. Deal. Condition. Amazing. Phil explains that the proceeds will support conservation efforts on the nearby fell. As they wrap up the visit, Drew reflects on the quality and uniqueness of the items found. The copper mine setting has been an extraordinary backdrop for their purchases. They conclude their day with a traditional Lake District treat by Coniston Water, enjoying both the scenic beauty and the success of their finds. <laughs> Drew's team visits Brampton, a town near Hadrian's Wall and the Scottish border. Today's destination, surrounded by wild landscapes close to Hadrian's Wall and the Scottish border. They enter a church hall filled with antiques, curated by veteran dealer Steve Summerson Wright. Passionate about antiques, shares that the learning never stops in this business. Drew is immediately impressed by the shop's rich setup and the depth of knowledge evident in the collection. Among the finds, he spots a Victorian gypsy table in pristine condition, despite its age. Priced at £175, Drew negotiates it down too. So what do you say, £150? Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Cheers. He then notices a mustard yellow painted hat and coat stand with a revolving top, dating from the late 19th century. It is worth around £400. Drew manages to secure it for... 100 quid. 210. Yeah. Cheers. Next, Drew discovers a two-tier trefoil side table with intricate patterns associated with cashmere. Although priced at £750, he negotiates it down to... 600 quid. 600. Good. Exploring the shop's back room, Drew finds large saddlebags that could be converted into cushions, priced at £65 each. He negotiates for a better deal and also picks up a small antique carpet for... That's a little antique one. 70 quid. A Persian rug catches his eye, listed at £295, but he acquires it for... Bargain for I have to, I'm buying a Persian rug for £230, quid. thank you very much. The rug, hand knotted and made of natural fibers, features rich colors. On 10 carpets, Drew spends a total of... Drew spends £865 on a total of 10 carpets. Including the standout Persian rug. Reflecting on the day, Drew is delighted with the quality and value of his purchases. Drew's VW Fastback is undergoing a transformation. The car is ready for its new color at the body shop. 
Drew's bespoke bumper has been fully re-chromed. And having been cut down to size, Drew's bespoke bumper has been fully re-chromed. He ordered a reproduction set of Sprint Star alloy wheels. Drew has a special plan for the tyres. From the late 60s into the 70s, you know, those massive big chargers and that sort of thing would have these red band tyres on them. To achieve his vision, Drew visits Aunt Edenshaw in Stafford, and, known as Mr. Whitewall, custom paints tyre sidewalls. For almost a decade, Ant Edensor, aka Mr. Whitewall, has been helping car fanatics. He's the only person in the UK offering this service. Drew requests a thin red stripe on the tyres. The red stripe is inspired by American hot rods. The striping process costs around £150. Ant uses a special buffing wheel and hand-applied paint. The VW Fastback is now back from the paint shop. Paul initially doubted the bumper, but now likes it. How good does that look? That looks fantastic. The car has cost around £9,500 to complete. Drew and Paul estimate its value at a whopping £10,995. The VW Fastback is now available for sale, offering a unique vehicle. Yes. I couldn't be more pleased with what the lads were saying about the car. They are all saying, I like the colour, I like what you've done with the front bumper. In Surrey, Drew and Paul inspect a Lancia Delta Integrale, trying not to get too excited. They hope to purchase it for around £15,000 to ensure a profitable renovation. The seller asks for £15,995, but they negotiate down to £15,250. Back at Bay's, Paul shares his ambitious plan for a full works rally replica with Drew. However, in Conway, Drew has second thoughts, finding the idea unappealing. Despite Drew's concerns, Paul pushes ahead with the plan, feeling the pressure. Paul seeks help from James Cameron, who runs Mission Motorsport in Staffordshire. Mission Motorsport specializes in building and repairing race cars, including hand-fitting bespoke liveries. The team at Mission Motorsport, consisting of ex-servicemen and women, takes on the challenge of wrapping the Lancia. They begin the meticulous process of applying a white base vinyl over the existing red paint. Using knifeless tape and heated vinyl, they replicate the iconic rally livery with precision. Drew arrives at the Kerbera Spring Circuit in Staffordshire to see the finished Lancia. Paul's asked Drew to meet him at Kerbera Sprint Circuit in Staffordshire at a track day for historic rally car. To his surprise, the full 1992 factory livery impresses Drew, who admits it looks great. The Lancia now owes them around £18,500, but Paul believes it could sell for a whopping £21,995. After the successful transformation, Paul finally relaxes, feeling proud of the outcome. After a job well done, Paul can finally relax. Drew acknowledges Paul's efforts, realizing the car has become something special. Drew and Jamie visited Chester Zoo, a 125-acre site home to over 2,100 animals. The zoo is selling Romanesque garden items, which caught Drew's eye. For over 85 years, Chester Zoo has been one of the city's best-loved attractions and is home to over 2,100 animals. He admired aged horsehead sculptures, though they were made of cast stone. These sculptures were valued at £500 for the pair. Drew then noticed a large pan sculpture, but its yellow colour reduced its value. This sculpture was priced at £400, less than it could have been if it were white. Stone benches in the garden were priced at £150 each. Drew agreed to buy all the benches for a total of £1,500. Negotiations for the sculptures and benches came to £2,900. Jamie introduced a quirky fibreglass penguin from the 1970s. This quirky fibreglass penguin is hand-painted and was probably made in the 1970s. Drew initially offered £250 for the penguin, but Jamie argued it was worth more. He emphasised the penguin's charm and sentimental value. Drew eventually agreed to pay £500 for the penguin. He was amused by the purchase, considering keeping it for his home. Drew knew the penguin would sell well in his shop if he decided not to keep it. The visit to Chester Zoo proved profitable for Drew. Jamie was pleased the funds would support the zoo's mission to prevent extinction worldwide. Drew and his team visit a high-end antique destination in Castle Carey, housed in a refurbished old factory. They bought an old factory, where the name comes from, and they've turned it into a high-end antique destination. The location, now a stylish showroom, impresses Drew with its top-class setup, though he worries about high prices. They meet David Tupman, a discerning dealer, and his daughter-in-law Tess, who run the shop. Drew admires a 20th century club fender, part seat, part fireguard, originally valued at £1,300. Appreciating its ideal size, shape, and colour, he negotiates it down to... 600 quid. Sure. Okay. 
Next, Drew finds a unique folk art mirror from early 20th century France. Originally priced at £600, he haggles it down too. We get it down to 550 and it's still, that's a, you know, that's still a, a bit of an ask, to be honest. The mirror, featuring an original distressed plate and unusual mosaics, captivates Drew with its charm. He also spots a mid-19th century farmhouse table, well worn with burn marks and oil stains. Drew values its rustic patina and negotiates the price too. Okay, dear. <laughs> 250. 250. It's not yours. <laughs> Although Tess is reluctant to part with it, Drew sees its potential after restoration. Drew is pleased with the day's purchases, particularly the mirror and club fender. He believes that he will sell them well. He appreciates the authenticity of the items and the profitable deals made. Reflecting on the visit, Drew enjoys the experience and interaction with David and Tess. A worn-out Buddha statue gets an unexpected, vibrant makeover. See how it turned out. Dealer Saxon Durant travelled to Bridgeport in Dorset to seek expert advice on his weathered Buddha statue. The main reason I'm here today is to find out a valuation on the Buddha, some provenance as well. Obviously it's a religious figure, so is it ethically sound to restore this and do any work on it? That's a, that's a major concern, I think. Particularly concerned with its ethical restoration. He met with antiques dealer Ray Paul, who specialises in religious iconography and owns the largest collection of antique Buddhas in the UK. Ray identified Saxon's statue as not the Buddha, but as a Hoti, a Chinese monk often called the Laughing Buddha. Saxon was relieved to learn that restoring the statue is a respectful way to honour it. Ray estimated the statue's origin to be from the 20th century, and noted that it had suffered significant damage from years of exposure. Saxon entrusted the restoration to sculptor Nick, who began by repairing cracks with plaster and rebuilding the statue with a new layer of concrete. The sculptor repaired cracks with plaster and applied a new concrete layer, aiming for a soft, stone-like finish. Constant wetting prevented cracks, and while Saxon wanted a weathered look, the sculptor's research led to more refined details. Nick conducted research on classical sculptures and decided to enhance the statue with vibrant colours, including golds, blues and yellows, rather than the stone look Saxon had initially envisioned. After weeks of work, Saxon returned to Colwyn Bay to see the results. He was surprised by the statue's transformation, which was far more colourful than he had anticipated. The restored Hoti statue, now a striking and vibrant piece, could be a centrepiece in a yoga retreat or hotel lobby. Saxon acknowledged the creativity and effort that went into the restoration, ultimately praising the result. Um, I, I, think that, I think the fact that you found that it was originally painted, yeah. that makes it right. The once dilapidated statue had been brought back to life with a fresh, colourful look. The project showcased the value of expert knowledge and artistic innovation. Drew visits the Tivoli Theatre in Aberdeen's Granite City. The theatre has been restored after being saved from ruin. Its owner, Brian Henry, is now looking to sell items from the renovation. Well, I bought it in 2009. At the time, it was in a critical state on the Buildings at Risk Register. Now fully restored, the building is Grade A listed. It retains many original features, including prismatic lanterns. Drew is impressed by the lanterns. And could be worth around £900. He negotiates and buys two smaller versions for £350. Drew and his team visit a historic castle near Kilmarnock. They find a pair of tassels. The tassels are over a hundred years old and were likely used as curtain tiebacks. Despite their worn condition, Drew appreciates their craftsmanship. And could be worth around £150. He buys the tassels for £50. Drew's heading 300 miles north to Bowness in Scotland's central lowlands. They visit the Ballantyne Casting Company, a family business that has been around since 1820. Drew finds a 19th century wooden mould of a memento mori. He buys it for £350, impressed by its historical and artistic value. Vintage finds and royal fabrics. Drew scores big with savvy deals. At Gainsborough Silk, a historic fabric company in operation since 1903, Drew uncovers a wealth of valuable materials and furniture. Co-owned by Neil Thomas, the business is renowned for supplying high-quality textiles to prestigious clients, including the royal household. I started working at Gainsborough in 1989 as a stopgap in between jobs, and the rest is, is history, as they say. Drew is immediately drawn to a special silk used in Queen Mary's doll's house, a fabric woven from organzine silk and known for its intricate design. Impressed by its quality, he negotiates a purchase of 5 metres at £85 per metre, amounting to £425. Exploring further, Drew finds a 19th century green velvet nursing chair. Although the fabric is water damaged and the chair's condition is poor, he recognises its potential. After negotiation, he buys the chair for £175, estimating that it could be worth £500 after restoration. 
His attention is then captured by a Victorian Chesterfield two-seater sofa, known for its deep button design and equal height arms and back. Despite the sofa's worn condition, with modifications over the years, Drew sees promise in it. He strikes a deal, acquiring the sofa for £150. Drew is thrilled with his purchases, believing they will greatly enhance the value of his inventory. He leaves the factory confident that the day's finds will significantly benefit his business. Explore Drew's hunt for hidden treasures and epic deals. Drew visits a high-end bed and breakfast that also hosts weddings and events. We uh, offer uh, high-end bed and breakfast here. Okay. And we're doing weddings and venue hire as well. Housed in a converted church, the owner has skillfully blended Victorian, 16th century and contemporary pieces, showcasing a unique space that took 20 months to complete. Drew is impressed by the use of original and modern elements, but is keen to explore potential purchases. The owner showcases a beautifully preserved original staircase and a Victorian dining room with new pieces by designer Mark Brazier-Jones. Drew notes the dining room's modern furniture, including a Japanese cabinet, and anticipates future value as it ages. Next, Drew explores the Gentleman's Club room, featuring military antiques and vintage items. Drew's attention is drawn to a blue-painted work table from a naval dockyard, which he admires for its colour and design, although the owner is hesitant to sell. There are a couple of things in here that I really do like the look of. One is the blue painted work table. Great top on it, and the colour's superb. Very, very good retail sort of display piece. Drew also notices a pair of late 1960s Danish caned walnut lounge chairs, valued around £1,200 once restored. They are offered at £200 each, totaling £400, which Drew considers a great deal. Finally, Drew finds an English Regency circular wall mirror with a gilt and painted finish, priced at £300. Despite one missing glass stud, Drew negotiates and purchases it for £200. Drew is pleased with the deals, especially the chairs, and is excited about the potential value of his finds.